Hi, my name is Rob Packard. I'm from Medical Device Academy. I'm recording a brief video about our 510K workshop in Amsterdam on October 10th and 11th. This segment, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the biocompatibility portion of that workshop. It'll, um, when we talk about biocompatibility, we'll be talking about uh, that for about an hour. I'll be the speaker. The other speaker at the conference is going to be Mary Vonner. The two of us will be uh, trading on and off talking about different topics. It's a very small group, so we'll be able to take time to answer any specific questions people have. And we also have networking in between the sessions, so we can also um, take time offline and answer specific questions about a company's product or service and uh, answer things that are specific to their company rather than general questions. For biocompatibility requirements, what I encounter is a lot of um, companies are testing products in Europe and they're compliant with the ISO 10993 guidance or standard, but unfortunately, the FDA has their own guidance on how to apply that standard. So if you just satisfy the notified body, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna satisfy the FDA's requirements. So it's very important that you review the guidance and understand how to apply that uh, standard. For those of you that aren't familiar with what standard it is, it's ISO 10993-1, and it's the 2009 version of the standard that was revised again in 2013. That's the official FDA-recognized standard right now for biocompatibility. Now, there's a new standard that was recently released uh, for 2018 in August, but that hasn't been recognized by the FDA yet, and the guidance document hasn't been updated yet. When you go to the FDA guidance, which was released in February of 2016, the guidance gives you, in addition to the standard, it also gives you some other additional recommended tests that the FDA wants to see for certain types of indications and certain types of contact and durations of contact. So they want you to consider these in your risk assessment and your biological evaluation report. A lot of companies will justify, well, we don't need to do this because there's so many other products just like it, you know, the exact same materials. And the FDA isn't debating whether titanium is biocompatible or polypropylene is biocompatible. They agree that these are biocompatible materials, but they're worried about residues, just like the European notified bodies. But they follow a specific guidance document to make sure that all the different divisions of the FDA and all the different panels are reviewing the same way. So it's a little bit tougher um, than you might have experienced from some of your notified bodies. They're going to say, well, show us a biocompatibility certification statement that says this is exactly the same material, made at exactly the same facility by the same process with the same uh, uh, processing agents and residuals. And you might not be able to prove that because you might not be the person that made the predicate and you might not be using the same contract manufacturer. And if you're using a test report for, let's say, uh, a master file that is for a polypropylene plastic, that still might not be enough because you don't know exactly what conditions they molded under. So without all that information, you can't say that your product is exactly the same in terms of its biological risks. The FDA also wants to see the testing done on a finished device, not on components or a similar um, molded part. They want to see it on your device because sometimes that can affect the results. So what a lot of companies are experiencing is they do all the testing for Europe, then they go to submit to the US FDA, and they have problems. So one of the best things you can do if, you've, if you're in the boat of, we're not sure that we're compliant with this standard and we want to make sure so we don't have to redo testing and submit twice to the FDA, the best thing you can do is do a pre-sub meeting to ask specifically those questions. And in preparation for that, what I often recommend to companies is that they come up with a biological evaluation plan first. So, I'm um, sorry, wrong one. Okay, so what is a biological evaluation plan? The biological evaluation plan concept, uh, the first place I saw it was Nelson Labs. N Nelson Labs is, uh, Thor Rollins is one of their toxicology experts there. He's in charge of the toxicology department. And he is uh, the person that was chairing the committee that was rewriting the biocompatibility standard for 2018, and he also works directly with the FDA. So this is the person that actually wrote the standard or helped write the standard 
so he knows what the the changes are and what they do is they put together a biological evaluation plan saying this is what we're going to do step by step to test your product and then they provide that to you you submit it in your pre sub meeting request and then they can even participate on a conference call with the FDA and they can answer any questions if the FDA agrees with a the plan, they go ahead and execute it. And then at the end, they write a biological evaluation report summarizing the results of that testing. So the FDA looks for the biological evaluation plan, the test reports, and the evaluation report at the end um, when you submit your 510K. And that goes through very, very smoothly. One of the first things that they'll typically have in that biological evaluation plan is cytotoxicity testing. So what is cytotoxicity testing? Cytotoxicity testing is a very simple, fast screening test that can tell you whether your product is cytotoxic to a certain mouse cell line. So they have these um, small uh, Petri dishes. They'll put an extract or they'll put part of your product on this. Uh, it's usually an extract on the Petri dish, and they'll see if it inhibits the growth of cells. If it does, then it's cytotoxic to the cells. If it doesn't, then it's not cytotoxic. And they grade it from a score of zero to four. Zero being no cytotoxicity, four being not good, just like um, latex products that are cytotoxic. It doesn't mean your product is toxic to people, it just means it's toxic to these cell lines. And you have to show additional testing to show your product is safe. So this will be often the first test. And if, it, if your product is not, so not cytotoxic, you might not need to do additional testing. But that has to be in your biological evaluation plan, and you have to provide that plan to the FDA and get them to agree to it. So first test would be cytotoxicity, and it's usually a fast test. It's usually, I think, 72 hours for the test, and it's a very inexpensive test, relatively speaking. Oftentimes, the GLP test report you need costs more than the testing itself. One of the next questions I get asked is how much to, how much time does it take to do all this testing? And like I said, the cytotoxicity test is a great screening test and it's very short, but it's not the only test. You also typically have to form the big three tests, cytotoxicity, skin sensitization, and skin irritation. And those other two tests are likely to take you 10 to 12 weeks. These are small animal tests, rodent tests, where they're looking to see if they cause rashes on the, on the animals. It's a standardized test, and it's done for almost every medical device out there. Um, they try to minimize that, so you, you don't want to have to do this for every single product you have. So you want to try to pick a material that's going to work for most of your products up front, test it, and then use that biocompatibility data for future products. But the first time you launch a product with new biocompatible materials, you're going to have to do this testing. So that's the first test you typically do is the cytotoxicity, and then you'll do the other two tests, skin sensitization, skin irritation, and each of those tests is gonna run you 10 to 12 weeks of time. The next question I get asked a lot is, how much does the testing cost? Now, it's gonna be different for different products because the amount of size of the product might require more extract or less extract. It, each material could require a different extraction method and depending on which test you pick, it could cost more or less. But to give you a ballpark, ten dollars to $15,000 is typically what I am used to seeing for the, the those three tests. And a recent quote I got from Nelson Labs was $13,000 for one of these tests. So you have to get your quote for your product. But to give you a ballpark, 10 to 12 weeks, $13,000 is what you're looking at. And you should always start out with this biological evaluation plan first, get it reviewed with the FDA and the test lab during the pre-sub meeting. They agree on it, they execute it. Then you get a summary report, this biological evaluation report, and you submit it with your 510K. So I think that covers sort of a, at a high level what the different things are that we're gonna be covering during this workshop on biocompatibility. But like I said, it's a really small group. You'll have an opportunity to ask both Mary and myself and possibly the other attendees, they may have some experience as well. And every single product is a little different, but we're there to answer your questions and explain how to put together your 510K submission. And specifically in this case, section 15, 
the biocompatibility section of your 510K. We'll even cover some templates that we have, and you'll get those if you register for our workshop. It's $600. If you follow the link that's going across the screen, uh, that'll take you to our website, and you can purchase the website, and you can even be a last-minute registrant. Uh, we start at 9 a.m. on the 10th. You don't have to show up any earlier, um, and we'll start out with welcoming remarks and how to um, determine um, uh, what is the best pathway for you to go if you have a C marked product and you want to convert that technical file into a 510K. I'll also be recording a few other webinars explaining uh, the different uh, talks that we're going to be giving throughout the days, but I've got a couple already posted, and this will be a new one, and we have a few more that are coming, but I look forward to seeing you in Amsterdam. Have a nice day.